We are calling to order meeting number 266 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on May 1st, 2019 at 10 a.m. at our offices at 101 Federal Street. We will begin with agenda item two, please. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins, approval of minutes. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, in your packet, you have the meeting minutes from the March 28th, 2019 meeting. I would uh, move their approval again, subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-1. Thank you. 5-0. 5-0. Oh, and 5-0. So sorry. Good morning. And it is a happy May Day. Um, as to the Commission's report, as you know, last night, the Commission issued its decision regarding the suitability of Wynn Resorts and Wynn Mass LLC. I wish first to thank my fellow commissioners. This has been a complex process requiring focus and thoughtfulness over the course of many, many hours, many, many days of deliberation. And to the entire team on behalf of the commission, thank you. As I said last night in the email to all of you, we, the commissioners, were able to focus on the process and doing our job because we knew that each of you have and would continue to fulfill your professional responsibilities. It is particularly important, and I, I am hesitant to do this, but to thank individuals because I hope you all know that we truly thank the entire team but I would be remiss to not point out the excellent work of the IEB and particularly um, Karen Wells, the director, Loretta Lilios, and Detective, um, Lieutenant, Detective Lieutenant Brian Connors. Your work was excellent and as we noted at the adjudicatory hearing, we were helped thoroughly by your methodical approach and care. I also would be remiss not to thank Ed Bedrosian, our executive director, for his steady hand throughout this period. And of course, the legal team, who has helped us day in, day out, headed by Catherine Blue, general counsel, Todd Grossman, Justin Stempak, and Carrie Troisi, who is having a birthday today. <laughs> Happy birthday, Carrie. I think she noted that maybe about the beginning of this week, how much she was looking forward to Wednesday. So thank you. <clears throat> Our mission is clear here at the Gaming Commission, ensuring public confidence in the integrity of the gaming industry and the strict oversight of the gaming establishments through rig rigorous regulation is without question our paramount objective. We all understand that the award of a gaming license in Massachusetts is different. It was never intended to be anything short of a peerless privilege. And the law requires that our licensees be held to the highest standards, including an obligation to maintain their integrity on a continued basis. Please know that we made our decision with great care as we methodically weighed the evidence in this matter, conforming to the standards of review that the law requires and expects of us. The law affords the commission significant breadth on our decision making, but with that comes a significant duty to be fair. And we are very confident that we have struck the right balance and met our legal and ethical burdens. For the reasons that are detailed in the written decision, the licensee and its qualifiers remain suitable. Although the Commission did not find substantial evidence necessary to disrupt the licensee's suitability status, the decision speaks for itself. We, the entire Commission, were profoundly disturbed by repeated systemic failures and the pervasive culture of non-disclosure 
presented in the IEB's thorough investigative report and the three-day adjudicatory hearing. To help ensure future compliance and indeed to punish for transgressions, the Commission has imposed a series of penalties and conditions, including a $35 million fine on wind resorts and the requirement of an independent monitor to ensure the continued and proper implementation of the company's proposed remedies. It's fair to say that recent changes to the company's governance model, policies, trainings and operations show a new commitment and focus on all levels of employees, which combined with the ongoing successful business operations continue to demonstrate that Wynn will likely be a successful operator in Everett. Given our findings, it is now in the interest of the Commonwealth that the gaming licensee move forward, establishing and maintaining that successful gaming establishment here in Massachusetts. One of the key metrics by which we will measure that success will be the overall well-being, safety, and wel welfare, excuse me, of the employees. A second but equally important metric is the importance of compliance and communication with the Commission as the regulator. We believe our decision in its entirety is designed to ensure full, effective implementation of the practices. The Commission, however, acknowledges that our role is not to micromanage corporate affairs or to substitute our judgment for theirs. Instead, our role is of gatekeeper, standing guard to ensure that the gaming license is operating consistent and with an obligation to integrity. But to be clear, transparency and self-reporting with the regulator is a hallmark of the regulatory landscape. We will expect nothing less of our licensee. Again, I wish to thank my fellow commissioners. This has been a demanding process. And I would like to offer the opportunity for you to share your thoughts at this time. Uh, I'd just like to echo your thoughts and thank the team. We were faced with a significant challenge, the entire commission, frankly. And uh, I'm very proud of the way the team um, put a plan in place, executed the plan, the investigative team, countless trips to get to the facts, to get to the truth, and provide us with a, with a really strong investigative report uh, to work from. So I just I really want to thank everybody, uh, IEB in particular, for the work that was done. Legal has worked uh, tremendously hard. And, and everyone at the commission understood how important this was and took their jobs very seriously and I'm, I'm very proud of the team. I would echo the same thing. I don't think it can be understated how critical the work of the IEB was to this process and also the work of the legal staff in helping these uh, five commissioners come to the conclusion of the deliberations that we did last week. I, I don't think that can be understated. Well, I'll restate it again and I think uh, uh, it's also um, <laughs> I think it's tremendous work. I think um, the record shows and will show that um, the work was very extensive and very thoughtful. Um, I think uh, as an adjudicatory matter, uh, the, the, the law and the, and the regulations also afforded the licensee significant uh, rights of due process. And on, in that context, uh, the time frame is one that we had to respect and allow for it to play through in terms of the discovery uh, piece, in terms of the investigation, but also the submission of materials um, with the proper turnaround for our own team, et cetera. So th I think that's important to, uh, to state here. Uh, we thought we were gonna be addressing this issue a little earlier than, than we have, and there was this uh, real uh, milestone, if you will, 
lingering in, in the horizon in the opening of this or the scheduled opening of this uh, operation. But at no time we wanted to compromise, and we di I don't feel that we did. Uh, these two crosses that I'm talking about, uh, we operated in parallel tracks, but importantly, uh, we had to address this and get it right. Uh, I really believe that we did, and uh, again, the, the, the decision speaks for itself. I also would uh, add my thanks to the, uh, to the IEB team, the legal team, you know, for their work over literally the past year um, helping us to get this right. I also want to thank our other departments who have done their work to maintain the, sure, maintain the commission's obligations with our other licensees over the last year and actually opening up another resort casino less than a year ago during this time frame. Um, I also want to thank my fellow commissioners. Um, you think back to the gaming statute and how it specifically wanted commissioners with different backgrounds and different experiences to come together to work and I found that personally uh, extremely helpful as we went through our deliberations. So thanks to the four of you as well. You know, let me let me add that uh, as well. That thank to uh, to all of uh, all of my fellow commissioners, but especially the newer ones, Madam Chair. I think you have really stepped up to the challenge. Uh, you have come a little newer than the rest of us um, uh, on the matter, but uh, but throughout the, this whole process, and uh, Commissioner O'Brien as well. Uh, I think the thoughtfulness that you bring to trying to understand what is um, at least uh, with, on some of us uh, uh, maybe uh, less unfamiliar topics uh, were really at display and I think uh, uh, it's, it's great. It's great that you're here. Thank you. Before um, we do take a break, there is one clarification that I've asked um, uh, Count General Counsel Blue to address and that's uh, the timing of the payment of the fines that um, have been imposed by our decision. It is a statutory matter. If you would like to address that now, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this matter is, is addressed in uh, our Enabling Act 23K, Section 36, Sections F through G. And what that requires is that any fine that's assessed would be paid within 30 days of the assessment of the fine unless there is a request for judicial review. And if the person requesting judicial review is the person who's paying the fine, the money goes into escrow in a court unless um, there is a petition to the court to replace that with a bond. So it, is, it has a pretty specific process for that. It is 30 days unless there is some sort of judicial review. Thank you. So the, the, just to emphasize, the, um, the licensee can ask for a reconsideration, is that uh, what you said, or appeal our decision? So a reconsideration would be an internal commission type process, and we have had, in other matters where the commission has acted, requests for a reconsideration. But the most logical next step would be review by a court, which would be the superior court in this case, and the licensee could do that if they so chose. Okay. And they have to do these within 30 days? Yes, that's right. Right. Any questions? And before we break, um, because I was so excited about wishing Carrie her birthday, I neglected to mention you, Shara. Shara Bernard, too, thank you so much for, for all the work that you were doing in many ways behind the scenes that made everything run very smoothly for us, our, our paralegal. Uh, on our schedule, we would like to take a short break now, and then we'll return to the commission's uh, business of the day. Thank you. As, uh, as I stated earlier, ensuring public confidence in the integrity of the gaming industry and the strict oversight of the gaming establishments <clears throat> through rigorous regulation is without question 
our paramount concern and objective. We all understand that the awarding of a gaming license in Massachusetts was never intended to be anything short of a peerless privilege. And the law requires that our li licensees be held to the highest of standards on an ongoing basis. As I stated earlier, we made our decision with great care as we methodically weighed the evidence before us, conforming to the standards of review that the law requires. The law does afford the commission significant breadth in our decision making, but with that comes an equally significant duty of fairness. We took that very seriously. We are confident that we have struck the correct balance and met our ethical and legal obligations. Again, as I stated earlier, and it can't be overstated how much I wish to thank my fellow commissioners. This has been a demanding process. And to the entire team, again, at the commission, on behalf of my fellow commissioners who truly join me, we thank the entire team for their diligence and patience. We recognize that this matter was professionally challenging and at many times required personal sacrifice. We thank all of the team for their important work on behalf of the Commonwealth. And we're available to take questions. What sort of message do you hope that this decision sends to the industry and to the people of Massachusetts? I, I think that the main message that we want to send is how much we feel our role um, is to secure the integrity of the gaming industry here to um, ensure that our gaming establishments rise to the level of excellence that our statutes require. And we also really want to make sure that the people of Massachusetts know that we will always protect the vulnerable and make sure our employees here in Massachusetts are safe. Was this a take it or leave it situation? What if Wynn says, we don't want to pay? You know, we can't speculate. We're looking forward to continuing a continued relationship. Our decision stands on its own. And, you, and the, the vote on Matt Maddox was not unanimous. What was the breakdown of votes? Um, you know, our deliberations are private. I'm going to let my fellow commissioners join us. Um, it's important to recognize that the deliberations um, are private. We honor each other's opinions and we respect our opinions. Uh, but we did make a decision, and we feel it supports and reflects the deliberative process. But I'm happy to have Commissioner Cameron. Would you like to join in? I, I think I think you said it well. I think anyone that um, observed the hearing and read the decision understands clearly what our concerns were, individually and collectively. And uh, I, I believe that our decision reflects that uh, those concerns. We, th we think we looked at um, all of the violations, all of the behavior, and we really believe our, um, our numbers are commensurate with that. Sure, as, as Commissioner Cam Cameron uh, mentioned, we do feel that that fine reflects the uh, scope and multitude of the violations. Um, we were very mindful that it should be, um, have the effect of, of two things. One, it should serve as a punishment uh, to really address um, those violations that we felt were um, the responsibility of certain executives and certain members of the board of directors. We also felt it was necessary to provide a message of deterrence to ensure future compliance. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, if I may, the, um, as the decision states, there is a number of instances, not just in, in terms of uh, the allegations that happened, but also in terms of disclosure to the commission that came that failed to come at different times. So, uh, the, the, as, as uh, the chair stated, um, the, the fine is meant to also act as a deterrence and future compliance to that uh, self-reporting uh, piece that we also expect. speak to that. Um, 
The statute provides for that it go to the gaming revenue fund, which is uh, divided by, you know, into several funds that you can check our website. Uh, it goes to a number of uh, places that are all statutorily provided. Aside from the possible judicial uh, appeal review here, is there anything else uh, that stands in the way of uh, Encore Boston Harbor opening this plan in June, uh, aside from the, the normal steps that any operator would have to go through to open this? You know, not that we know of. There continues to be um, many decisions in front of us, and we will be starting to address those uh, going forward in our meetings uh, between now and their anticipated opening date. Is that fair to say? With the, with the violations that you identified in the infrastructure, quite serious, the $35 million in fines, um, what, what, how did they fall short of something that would require you to say, you know what, no violence? Uh, what, what, what didn't they do, or what more would have been necessary? What, why not just pull the license and say, let's give it to another company that doesn't have a you know, I think that would really force us to speculate, and our, the requirement before us was to really look at the facts that were squarely before us. I'm not sure if, um, perhaps, would you like to add to that? Um, as was referenced before, once the license is attached, while it is revocable, there are due process rights that, and procedures that apply to any adjudication that would take away the license. And I think this decision does stand for itself if you look at the process that this commission went through in terms of assessing the record before us under the lens of what the statute allows us to do in the evidence before us. And we got to this decision that, in our opinion, the evidence and the statute that we have to go by mandated. Can I, can I, can I, can I add something to that? Because I think it's important, but it's also in the decision. Uh, the company also took a number of steps before we made this decision that are that have to be taken into account. Uh, they, uh, there's, no, there's a number of people who are no longer at the company who were directly involved and implicated in some of these allegations. And they presented a number of uh, processes and procedures that we will verify, by the way, and that's part of the uh, monitoring piece that's also part of the conditions uh, that, uh, that we believe have to be taken into account when, when uh, determining uh, the whole suitability. One more question. You know, it's our understanding that the company did make certain proposals for conditions, and we reviewed those, and with respect to that, we um, decided that not to incorporate that formally into our conditions, but certainly the, if the company thought it was a good idea, we'll let them proceed um, as they see fit. Well, you know, we have imposed fines, and we've imposed some significant conditions. And one of them will be to um, have a independent monitor go in there. Uh, the company has proposed to us what we consider were quite comprehensive proposals and practices that would mitigate their past transgressions and, um, um, you know, really work for their transformative process and change that they told us about, but to really ensure, in fact, the effective implementation that you're considering and questioning about, the independent monitor will report back to us on that, and that should give us the confidence to know that, in fact, that change is real. And that uh, monitor will be selected by us at the company's expense. No. Thank you. You know, our deliberative process is, is really uh, a private process, and how it was managed is probably not really a matter for uh, public uh, purview, but we were very respectful of hearing everybody's opinions. And, um, and, and we really were able to come out comfortably with an outcome that we fully, as a commission, as a group, support. Did you ever consider Thank asking you. that Maddox to step down as part of this decision? He's protege of Steve Wynn. He was very close, uh, close to him. Was that part of your deliberation? I think the decision is so detailed it speaks for itself. Thank you. 
We will now reconvene meeting number uh, 266. Thank you. Administrative update. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Um, so I would be uh, remiss if I also didn't add um, my thanks to staff and the commission um, for all their work in the past year, year and a half. And I want to reflect uh, specifically what Commissioner Stebbins said was that in addition to the um, sort of obvious portions of commission staff, the IEB uh, and the GEU that was working hard doing the investigation, there were many other um, portions of the staff that kept their heads down and did the day-to-day -day work, including some you'll hear from today, finance and, and uh, racing. Um, you know, we had HR, our administrative staff. Uh, there were a lot of folks who during this sort of uh, semi tumultuous times really kept their head down and did their jobs and I'm, I'm, I'm as, as proud as I am of the obvious folks I'm even more proud of those folks so uh, Commissioner Stebbins and commissioners thank you for uh, uh, noting that in your comments also um, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you um, you were in a uh, 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 super challenging position um, you had to wait for a lengthy investigation in a situation in which there was um, a outward deadline that could have influenced um, events, did not, and you were uh, patient um, in, a, in a time period in which patients could have been at a low level. Um, you were respectful of the process, um, and you gave me as the executive director um, the authority to try and, and, and get us through this time um, with the backup, and I, I, I truly appreciate that. So thank you very much. But, um, but now on to our regular business. Um, and as I have said in past meetings, while the IEB was conducting its investigation, and even during the Commission's deliberations, other staff members were working on a, what we called the parallel path to prepare for what we call at the time a potential opening of Encore Boston Harbor. And now that the Commission has reached a decision, there are pre-opening matters that need to be cited by the Commission and can only be decided by the Commission. And uh, to that end, I'm going to ask permission to schedule a public meeting of the Commission, and I will just say reasonably soon, um, to start to address these matters. I think this would also reflect that between now and the opening date, we may need to schedule commission meetings uh, more frequently and maybe out of order of what our usual every other Thursday is. Um, and so I just want to alert and work with the commission on that. So um, we, we have a path forward. Um, the good news is, as I said, those portions of staff have been preparing, um, but we, do, we now need your assistance. And so um, if with your permission, I will, as I said, reasonably soon schedule uh, those issues in front of the commission. So that is, again, thank you very much. That is my update. And uh, if there are any questions, I, I will answer them. If not, I will turn it over to Derek Lennon, one of the one of the folks I talked about who kept his head down and kept uh, you know the money flowing, for lack of a better term, kept the finance and budget and everything on track during this time. Thank you, Executive Director Bedrosian. Um Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we I am joined by Agnes Bollier, Douglas O'Donnell, uh, and we're here to present to you the <coughs> FY19 third quarterly budget update. But before we do that, we'd like to echo the sentiments of everyone that's said it already, the Herculean efforts and difficult decisions and thoughtful process you went through um, for your decision on suitability. Um, so thank you for the time and effort. But now we want to really get on to the interesting stuff, um, you know, our third quarterly budget update. Um, spoken, like a, spoken like a CFO. <laughs> A little bit of dry humor there. Uh, the Mass Gaming Commission approved an FY19 budget uh, for the Gaming Control Fund of $33.4 million, composed of $22.6 million in regulatory costs and $10.79 million in statutorily required costs. The Gaming Control Fund required an initial assessment of $28.32 million on licensees 
As of the last update, the Commission's budget increased by $3.1 million, which was funded through a combination of carry-forward revenue from FY18, licensing fees outpacing projections, and an additional assessment on licensees. For this third quarter, staff is seeking to increase the budget again by $1.3 million, all in legal costs. However, we're not looking to increase the assessment on licensees as the majority of the additional costs are associated with the Wynn Resort Suitability Review and are therefore 100% reimbursable. Uh, in addition, licensing fees continue to outpace even the revised uh, revenue estimates and we've increased that budget item by $295,000. Um, of the $1.3 million that we're seeking in legal fees, about $800,000 that's already spent and the other $500,000 are bills we're waiting to get um, in and that we think at least 50 to 70 percent of that should be reimbursable as part of the regulatory review after reviewing it with um, Catherine. So that's the reason that we're not looking for an increase to the assessment at this time. Um, in conclusion, staff is seeking a vote to increase the gaming control fund budget by 1.3 million to 37.8 million, um, and it's based on the information in your packet. Any questions, comments? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You were seeking a vote? Yes, to increase okay. the budget. To, um, I'm sorry, I don't know if we had Should noted we that on our, is that an issue then? Should we? Well, I, I would like to um, share with the commission that the Attorney General's Open Meeting Law Division has actually just issued an opinion where this question came up um, and they came down on the side of as long as it was reasonably described on the agenda but vote was not there, you could in fact vote on that. So this is a decision that came down in the last week or two. Having said that, and I, of course, because it's under my administrative item, I probably own part of this. As I said, I anticipate another meeting reasonably soon. So I wouldn't think it's a big deal just to put this off for that reasonable period That's and fine. then the vote would be relatively, hopefully relatively quick. I would suggest that, although I do appreciate the opinion of the AG's office, I, I think if, if that would be acceptable to you, does Absolutely. that in any way impact your work? No, it doesn't because we've already sent out the assessment because we're not increasing our third quarterly billing because we're not increasing the assessment. Um, but our internal policy is any time right. we change the budget, the commission has to approve it. Okay, okay thank you very much. Then um, we will make sure at our next meeting to address this um, with respect to noting a vote needed. Thank you. And at this point, um, I'd like to turn it over to Agnes to give us an update on our diversity uh, vendor spend. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Today in your packets you have the Supplier Diversity Program benchmarks and the Massachusetts Gaming Commission's total spending and encumbrances to date through the third quarter for FY19. Currently we have reached and surpassed our benchmark for the small businesses and the minority owned businesses. We are continuing to work towards our goal for the women owned businesses and there are a few more encumbrances that we are looking to add. Um, for the end of the year, but we are still reaching out to all of our vendors to see if they have any subcontractors that they can that can be applied to this category. This, however, this category still remains a challenge for us. We have also engaged the services of a vendor that is reviewing our procurements and reaching out to potential vendors for responses. The final category of service disabled veteran owned businesses remains a bit of a challenge, but we have identified a vendor for office supplies and are continuing to work with them. We are looking to use the vendor whenever it is economically prudent to do so <coughs> and we have um, more bills that have recently come in from them so that will be in the fourth quarter's update. Mm -hmm. just, just to touch on a few of those items, um, the women owned businesses has been a difficult area for us for the last two or three years. So we have actually engaged a vendor named Veracloud. We'd like to bring them in um, later on in the year when things kind of quiet down a little bit to give you an idea of what they've been helping us with. Um, they actually look through all of our statewide contract spend, all the statewide vendors to figure out if there are areas that we can change where we're doing work um, and give, give business to another vendor. For all of our RFRs, we give them advance notice of when they're going out. 
what services we're looking at, and they actually reach out to um, vendors who are on the list but that haven't actually received um, contracts in the past with the Commonwealth. So they have gotten us two to three time multipliers mm -hmm. of diverse vendors that are submitting proposals. But once again, if it's not the best value, we can't we can't uh, procure with them. But they've actually gotten us three or four additional. Um, um, minority women-owned suppliers that we hadn't contracted with and hadn't received state contracts in the past. And they're relatively inexpensive. Um, I think they charge about 2500 to 3000 per procurement that they work on for us or per engagement, um, which we would burn through much quicker in staff costs um, to, to utilize this. They're a statewide vendor as well. Um, Unfortunately, they do not check any of the boxes as far as minority or women-owned or, um, but they are on the incubator um, procurement. And on the veteran side, we, I've actually taken this issue to Jill's group of, um, of quasi groups and it was um, run by Habeas, uh, Habeas Rojas. Rojas. Rojas, yeah. Rojas. And this is an issue that everyone's coming into with veterans. Um, they don't have a great way to deal with it. I begged and pleaded. I said we're having a hard time finding vendors in this area. Unfortunately, a lot of the vendors that are veteran status have to do with construction. We don't do much construction um, on our own spend. While our licensees may, we do not. Um, so office supply is one of the areas that our Veracloud pointed out to us. So we're shifting costs over to them, even though, as our licensees might not like to hear, it may be a little bit more expensive, but it builds that base, allows them to grow their um, their business and then get a little more competitive in pricing. Well, it may also help our licensees, who I know are also facing the same challenge of finding veteran-owned businesses. So sharing that information, they may be able to increase their vendor spend in some cases. Yes. Yeah, I'd really, I really like the idea of having a demonstration uh, in the future from yes. uh, what VeraCloud does. Um, I understand it at a very high level. Uh, they're some kind of an online platform that and they can check through technology. Um, all of the things that you were talking about, um, maybe uh, people who are submitting bids but not getting them, uh, among other things. So I think we benefit from, um, from a demonstration uh, at some point. Yeah, and I, I appreciate the effort. It seems to me that you really, you, you know there's a goal, you know it's important for us to meet our goals, and you're not just saying, well, we couldn't do it uh, because, you know, no one applied or they weren't competitive uh, price-wise, but you're making that extra effort, and I think that's important. Well, and I think we're just an interesting entity in that we're almost putting the same requirement on the people that we regulate. It's nice if we can say we're trying to meet those same goals and efforts as well. It, it's paramount, really. So yeah. um, I think that you've taken good initiative to address really a challenge. Um, are you also working with OSD closely? So we, we do work closely with Dimitri. Yeah. We work closely with um, with uh, Bill, Bill McAvoy. 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 We, and, you know, they, they come to those same groups. They and do. And they have the same mm -hmm. issues. The same um, challenges. And getting the base and getting the, a lot of it is getting people to understand what the right commodity codes are too, which is what Veracloud has helped with. Their data mining skills are, are quite impressive. Um, to say to vendors, you're not getting information on these RFRs or on these opportunities because you haven't signed up for the right code. So when a state agency posts something in their public procurement side, you're not getting notification even though you fall under these services. Um, so that's what Veracloud has helped us with a lot, um, as well as going out and just pounding the streets and saying to people, working with chambers of commerce and saying, hey, do you have other vendors that could register? I know the administration has taken a lot of st steps to streamline the process to make sure certification is accessible to the vets and to the women-owned businesses and the minority-owned businesses. So it sounds like you're getting good guidance so that we make sure we're not creating additional obstructions to the their they're ref um, replying to RFPs, whatever we can do to sort of keep it um, streamlined. And that so is that's our goal. Good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that, <laughs> quite frankly, Derek. Anything else? Derek, I do have just, um, just looking at prior trends, our budget has uh, mostly increased on the labor side. Uh, we've been, and we'll be hiring uh, more gaming agents and, and, and whatnot. Um, 
does that how does that change if if at all the calculation of the diversity spend so it's actually uh <laughs> The administration, and we follow the administration mm -hmm. rule, has actually increased the percentages of your um, targets for diversity spend. So while our budget may be shrinking and our di discretionary budget may be shrinking, the rate applied is increasing. So we've stayed pretty much consistent as far as what we're required to spend, even though we've continued to downsize on consultants, we've continued to streamline in the IT area with bringing more things in-house. Um, a lot of our contracts are already locked up, but um, and you know so we've really had to push for our contractors to look for subcontracting opportunities to meet these goals uh, because when you look at IT, a lot of that goes to our central monitoring system. Yes. Um, when you look at the consultants or legal budget, it's all with one or two vendors, and they don't they don't have that minority distinction, but it doesn't mean that it's excluded. Um, because you're supposed to try and work for subcontracting opportunities on those contracts. Well, we appreciate yeah. this report, and, and I suspect that we will be also joining you in thinking about this innovatively because it's so important. We look forward to that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank that you. is the Thank end you. of the administrative update. Thank you, um, Executive Director Petrosian. Next, um, we will hear from Director Wells on um, an MGM qualifier. Thank you. And again, uh, it's an opportunity to remind folks how thankful and appreciative we have been for your thorough work in the IEB um, investigative report and at the hearing. Thank you very much. We wish your colleagues were next to you right now, but it, it's nice to see you, I'm sure, in a different role right now. Yes, so thank I, you. I was very fortunate to have the best team available uh, in working on that investigation. Brian Connors, Loretta Lillios, uh, Gina Joyce, Kevin Condon. We had an assistance from some outside consultants, just an unbelievable team. So I'm, I'm very proud of the work that they completed. Are you, you is that on, or can you get closer? Yeah, it to is that? on. Maybe I'm it's just on, not just closer. closer. Okay. Yeah, so I have not sat before you in uh, my uh, general capacity as the director in 15 months. So uh, for the first item up uh, on the IEB's agenda, uh, we have the results of the suitability investigation for Patrick Martin, who is a qualifier for MGM Resorts International. You have already received and I presume reviewed the investigative report on Mr. Martin. The investigation was conducted by Trooper John Morris and financial investigators David McKay and Monica Chang. Uh, Mr. Martin was hired by MGM uh, as Vice President of Regional Compliance in February of 2018. Based on his position, we made a determination that he be t uh, deemed a qualifier for the Region B casino license and that he be required to be found suitable by you as members of the commission. He submitted his application materials on April 30th, 2018 submitted all those forms along with supplemental documentation requests uh, to the licensing division and the investigators and complied with all the requests made by the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Uh, areas covered during his background check included his employment history, criminal record, education, political contributions, references, media coverage, directorships and shareholder interests, civil litigation, bankruptcies, uh, and property ownership among other things. Mr. Martinez was interviewed in person by the IEB State Police and financial investigators on February 7th of 2019 as part of the investigatory protocol. And investigators all con also conducted a financial responsibility evaluation and that had positive results as you uh, reviewed in the report. Mr. Martin attended the University of Kansas where he uh, earned a bachelor's degree in philosophy in 1995. He returned to the University of Kansas from 1999 to 2002 where he received his Juris Doctorate. He is an attorney. Uh, as for his employment history, uh, he has worked at three law firms both prior to becoming an attorney and as an attorney, uh, Shook, Hardy and Bacon, Leeson, Gooey and Coulson, uh, Shughart Thompson and Kilroy. And then he transitioned into uh, his positions as a gaming regulator, first working at the Kansas Racing and Gaming Commission as general counsel and executive director, and then at the Ohio Casino Commission uh, as director of regulatory compliance. 
He then uh, was offered and accepted a position with MGM Resorts uh, International uh, as the Vice President of Regional Compliance, which is why uh, his uh, consideration for his suitability is before you today. He explained to investigators that MGM Resorts is generally comp comprised of three regions. They have the Macau region, the Las Vegas region, and then what he deemed everything else. Properties outside of Las Vegas and Macau are referred to by MGM internally as their regional properties. In his role, Mr. Martin oversees compliance for MGM properties in Detroit, Michigan, Springfield, Massachusetts, Atlantic City, New Jersey, Yonkers, New York, Washington, D.C., Mississippi, and Ohio. He works out of an office located near MGM Resorts Har National Harbor property in Washington, D.C. He's responsible for ensuring that his regional compliance team adheres to and complies with the various regulations placed on MGM by the different states in which the company operates. Mr. Martin said that part of his role includes on-site visits to the different uh, regional MGM properties and that he attempts to visit at least one property every couple of weeks. He uh, reports directly to Mr. Steve Martino, who was previously found suitable by this commission. He disclosed that he has three gaming-related licenses or registrations due to his role with MGM. That's in New Jersey, uh, Michigan, and Maryland. Investigators confirm with the following gaming jurisdictions that he is registered, licensed, or has been found suitable under MGM Resorts under International. That's Michigan Gaming Control Board and the Maryland Lottery and Game Control Commission. Uh, no derogatory information was discovered in those jurisdictions. And at that, the time of this report before you today, the results to inquiries remain pending with the New Jersey Casino Control Commission. Uh, Mr. Martin was involved in civil, lit civil litigation matters related to his positions at the Kansas Racing and Gaming Commission and Ohio Casino Control Commission, and nothing in those matters negatively impacted his suitability for licensure. Uh, during his interview, he was asked if he had personally or uh, through any established LLC or other financial vehicle paid out any settlements of any amount, uh, and he answered he had not. He was asked if any allegations ever had been made against him relative to harassment, discrimination, or misconduct of any kind, or if he had participated in any act of harassment, discrimination, or sexual misconduct, and he replied in the negative. Uh, there were no significant issues uncovered related to Mr. Martin's application for licensure. So overall, he demonstrated by clear and convincing evidence he is suitable for licensure in Massachusetts. Therefore, the IEB is recommending that the Commission find him suitable here today. I, I thought it was a good report. I think what's interesting and ironic is the conversations we had earlier this morning about the relationship between the regulator and the regulatee. Right. Uh, that his background has been on the public sector side and even more importantly his relationship with Stephen Martino who we all know when he was executive director of the Maryland Lottery. Right. Um, somebody who gave us a lot of direction early on in the standing up of this commission. But uh, uh, we know Patrick will take our interest to heart in his new position, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, um, I think this is a clean report, and um, I would uh, move that this commission um, approve panel, uh, Patrick Daniel Martin, Vice President of Regional Compliance for MGM Resorts International. Uh, we rep uh, approve his uh, his uh, the recommendation of IEB that he is uh, suitable uh, as a qualifier. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0, and thank you for your thorough report. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wells. Next up, good morning, Dr. Light Brown. Good morning. It is good, good to see good the three of you. You um, have um, three items for us to consider today. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you all and uh, Director Bedrosian and General Counsel Blue and her legal team for everything you guys have done over the past year. Um, although you've been very busy, everybody's made sure that there was time for racing and to address different items that have come up from us. So I appreciate that. Um, our first item is uh, reimbursement of the uh, 2017 unclaimed tickets. Um, this is a ongoing process that started earlier this year where um, any um, individual patrons who had claims on tickets um, were validated by um, 
Chief Financial Analyst uh, Chad Bork with the different tracks. Um, that came before the commission for approval. Once that was approved, um, it, it went back to um, letters to the tracks asking for the money to be sent to the commission and the commission received the money. Um, and then now at this point, um, we're asking for a vote to send this money back to um, where the money statutorily goes um, from the unclaimed tickets. For um, the horse tracks, it goes to the purse accounts um, where there's no Greyhound racing. Um, when that ended, uh, the uh, legislature created the Greyhound Racing Stabilization Fund and the money goes into that fund now. Um, and originally that money um, went to um, owners and trainers um, through a program um, that ended several years ago. And now the money, there's not a mechanism for the money to go out, so, but it still goes into that um, pot. Um, so I'll turn it over to uh, Chad now. Be before you do that, um, Alex, remind me on, the, on, the, on your point about the um, dog racing, um, have we, uh, do, uh, do we approve those transfers or do they happen automatically? Transfers to the... the you approve, you're approving them are, okay. um, today, yes. We're it's also voting. That's Late, what you later, would later, I guess. Is it's a second you have That's, the, <laughs> that's what we're asking the next for. Page. The next step. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. That's okay. Was Thank you. Behind the old peg. Yes. So those are there as well as yes. the... Good morning, Madam Good. Chair and Commissioners. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, so for the unclaimed tickets for horse tracks, those go back into the purse accounts. And for 2017, the amount Sterling Suffolk will reimburse is for $224,045.33. And the amount for Plain Ridge Racecourse, they will reimburse for $186,705.64. The unclaimed tickets from the Greyhound tracks will go into the Racing Stabilization Fund. For 2017, the amount Wonderland will reimburse is for $7,981.23. And the amount for Raynham Park will reimburse is for $150,144.70. These funds, uh, they were delivered to the commission. They have cleared. And so with your approval, we will go ahead and um, allocate the funds accordingly. Any questions? No. Do we need to address this separately or can we combine this? Would it be, uh, actually, uh, Catherine, do you recommend it? to be separate votes with respect to the dog racing versus the horse racing? Uh, separate votes as to each track or dogs versus horses? The um, I think separate tracks as separate votes as to dogs versus horses, yes. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd move that the commission approve uh, the deposit of unclaimed wagers into the person counts of the rating racing meeting licensees um, as prescribed in the packet to Sterling Suffolk Downs and Plain Ridge Racecourse. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Five zero. Thank you. Commissioner Stevens? Uh, secondly, I'd move that uh, the commission approve the amounts from unclaimed tickets by Greyhound meeting licensees be dedicated to the racing stabilization fund is prescribed in the packet to Wonderland Greyhound Park and Raynham Park. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0. Okay, thank you. Dr. Light Brown. The uh, next two items are um, dealing with Suffolk Downs opening. They are going to be racing the 18th and 19th of May. Those That will be their first weekend. Um, today, representing Suffolk Downs, we have uh, Jessica Paquette, uh, Hi, Vice good President of Marketing. Um, just an update. Uh, Suffolk did get their um, NTRA accreditation through the Safety and Integrity Alliance um, re-upped for this year. And um, also the um, track inspection is going to be done later on this week. So, Excellent. Um, our first item is the um, Suffolk Downs request for a reduced takeout. Um, statutorily, they can take out no more than 19% on um, one place and show and 26% on um, exotics. Um, for the last, uh, this is something they've asked for for the last five years. 
um, and the commission has approved it. Uh, they have uh, felt that it's been a success for them, and they're asking to do it again um, this year um, with <clears throat> uh, similar takeouts uh, from before, 16% on the wind place and show, and the 19% um, on the exotics, and this does require a vote. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I familiar with this. Um, I think it's an appropriate request, and um, I move that the commission um, approve the request of Suffolk Downs to reduce the takeout to 16% on wind, place, and show, and 19% on exotics, as uh, recommended by our racing division. Second. Any discussion, questions? All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. And the next item is the Suffolk Downs request for approval of their uh, key operating personnel and racing officials. This is uh, something similar uh, to what you did uh, about a month ago with Plain Ridge for their um, key operating and officials. Um, again, a lot of these people are coming from um, out of town and they may not be licensed with us currently, so we're asking that you approve them. Um, pending satisfactory completion of their um, background checks by the state police and um, pending approval by the uh, stewards. Um, just looking at the list of um, folks on there, it's they're all familiar to us and have been in these positions before. Dr. Leibaum, I don't see Susan's name on there. Will she not be judging this year? Well, Su Susan it works for the Gaming Commission. Oh, I'm so sorry. You're right. You're <laughs> She'll right. Definitely we don't there. have to approve her. Yeah. <laughs> right. We've already approved her. Yeah, I would have. Okay. <laughs> Terrific. I'm, I'm happy to see she's back then. Yes. Yep. She wouldn't miss it. <laughs> Do we have a motion or further questions? Madam Chair, I'd move the Commission approve the request of Suffolk Downs to approve their April 24, 2019 list of key operating personnel and racing officials, pending approval by the stewards and satisfactory completion of the background checks by the Massachusetts State Police. Second. Any further discussion, questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. And before you go on, Dr. Lightbound, I don't think I've seen you to thank you for um, really hosting me on the opening day at Plain Ridge. I was there with um, Executive Director Verdrosian, and it was a lot of fun. So it thank is. you. It was <laughs> interesting, coming. and it was a real, a real treat for me, but you also showed the level of professionalism around the and introduced me uh, to the racing officials and the people down there, and it was impressive, and I appreciate very much your time, so thank oh, you. Thank you, it was wonderful having you out there. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Leipam, while you're here, yeah. um, we've, had, we've <laughs> had a few uh, weeks of racing. Do, any Audible. update on how things are going at Plain Ridge? Any issues or concerns? They're going well. Um, they've, um, been, they've had some 12 race days, which is what yes. uh, Steve O'Toole was hoping for, was to move up and, and have more races per day. Mm -hmm. um, the fields have been fairly full, so that's you know gone well as far as that Great. goes. So. I look forward to getting out there. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Yeah. Any further Thank questions? You. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. We're on item seven, Commission Commissioner's updates. Do we have any in particular? Well, I will just give a quick, quick update that, um, as you all know, we um, we have been selected by the International Gaming Regulators to host the two, 2020 uh, Gaming Regulators Conference. So we will have regulators from around the world here. And I just wanted to thank Janice Riley for um, working diligently on, um, there's a lot of uh, prep work that has to be done, bids for hotels, and, and she's really been taking the lead. And I just wanted to thank her and let all of you know that um, it's being done in a very professional way. And um, I know that the, the, uh, the board from the international regulators is, uh, is very pleased and um, appreciative of the, the work we're doing well in advance of that conference. It, yeah, it would, it's, uh, it's great visibility, I think, for the state and, and for this, uh, for the industry. Um, do, you, do we know where it's going to take place? No, the, we're in that process now. Okay. We've received bids. 
Um, we're certainly trying to get uh, mindful that these folks are regulators trying to get uh, an appropriate price point is challenging in Boston, but um, I know that uh, Janice is on it and working hard to uh, negotiate. Great. Any other items? Do we have uh, any further business from from you, Executive Director Petrosian? All set. Thank you very much. All set. I move to adjourn. A second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you, everyone.